Hello, this is John Rion, and welcome to the real world as we together are seeking truth daily. And I really appreciate you guys following me on Facebook and subscribing to me over on YouTube, John Rion. Uh, they deleted my account over on YouTube that I had 27,000 uh, subscribers and it was growing fast. And you got to watch what you say these days, but maybe I can just put up on screen and show you something that transpired back on October 18th, 2019. And this was held in Wuhan, China. And you can find this yourself if you simply Google how many nations were involved in 2019 military world games. This is the U.S. military was involved and 140 uh, nations total were involved. So 139 plus the U.S. military. Athletes participating were 9,308. It only takes four or five people from each nation to spread because once you take your military units out of Wuhan, they go into the barracks, wherever they're stationed at, and then people go home for leave. And then, you know, I don't know, something could get spread throughout the world fairly easily by way of participating in a Wuhan global military world game. So uh, uh, that's just how something might have got started that wanted to bring about a global reset. I don't know, does it seem possible? Because I think didn't the um uh, this 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 sickening aspect of people's health start to occur in January of twenty twenty into February twenty twenty, March twenty twenty, we shut down travel from China and then now here we are. So I don't know. It looks kind of suspicious to me because I think the Chinese knew that these 140 different nations were going to be in Wuhan, China on October 18th, uh, participating in sports for a couple weeks. And here we are. So, you know, what I would like to attach to this is to inform you and help you understand how did the United States mainstream media get so corrupt? How did the upper oligarchs of the United States get control of our mainstream media. We're going to go back in history to starting in, two, in 1917, and you're going to understand that ever since newspaper, radio, television, and now the Internet, these oligarchs control not just the mainstream media, but the social media. And the people that are controlling social media are called the technocrats, okay? So... Here's a little bit of a history lesson for you. I hope you learned something because you can research it for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Look up a guy named Professor, Professor Carol Quigley. He was an actual insider that wrote a book for the insiders, but then it got out into the public and people were looking at what he was writing from files that Professor Carol Quigley was allowed to examine for two years on this little club called the CFR and what he found and what he uh, wrote down and what wound up in the public hands will shock and amaze you. Search that. Professor Carol Quigley, Tragedy and Hope. It was a book he wrote that the CFR members and the insiders alone were supposed to be able to read to understand their founding. And he did this back in the 1960s. So here's the history lesson I hope you all learn from. The year is 1917, and Representative Oscar Calloway enters a disturbing statement into the U.S. congressional record. The statement reveals why J.P. Morgan Interests hired 12 high-ranking news managers. The Twelve were asked to determine the most influential newspapers in America. They were to figure out how many news organizations it would take to control generally the policy of the daily press of the United States. The Twelve found it was only necessary to purchase the control of 25 of the greatest papers. 
an agreement was reached. The policy of the papers was bought and an editor was placed at each paper to ensure that all published information was in keeping with the new policy. Soon, that policy would be defined by a front group formed by J.P. Morgan and his colleagues. In fact, Morgan's personal attorney was founding president of the organization, the Council on Foreign Relations. Today, the CFR maintains that its goal is to increase America's understanding of the world. However, the actual objective of this highly exclusive club is revealed by the rare admissions of the insiders themselves. In the early 60s, a Georgetown University professor collects information for a book favorable to the network of powerful men who founded the CFR. For two years, Professor Carol Quigley is allowed to examine the confidential papers and secret records of this network. Quigley reveals that these men aim to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. In short, they seek total and quiet control of the entire world. And the CFR is their most visible conduit for carrying out that agenda. CFR members include America's wealthiest tycoons, as well as the highly placed elite in government, academic institutions, tax-exempt foundations, and the establishment media. Ruling Class Journalists, written by Richard Harwood, describes the CFR membership as the ruling establishment in the United States. The Washington Post article boasted that news reporters who are CFR members do not merely analyze and interpret foreign policy for the United States, they help make it. Who are these policy makers? Many of their faces are familiar. NBC's Tom Brokaw, CBS's Dan Rather, ABC's Barbara Walters, Jim Lehrer of PBS, William F. Buckley of National Review, media mogul Rupert Murdoch, owner of the giant multifaceted news corporation. These media heavyweights and many others like them are members of the CFR. Powerful corporations are also invited to become members. At the close of the 20th century, CFR influence presided over far-reaching consolidations of media control. In 1995, CFR members Michael Eisner of Disney and ABC's Thomas Murphy merged their media empires. Soon after the merger, the Disney-ABC empire becomes a CFR corporate member. In the year 2000, the world's largest internet service provider, America Online, joins forces with Time Warner, one of the world's largest news organizations. The CEOs favoring the move are CNN's Thomas Johnson and Time Warner's Gerald Levin, both CFR members. Once again, another media giant is created under the shadow of CFR influence. Today, an elite handful of individuals define the agendas that are supported by the empire of establishment news. I refer first to the need for far greater public information and second to the need for far greater official secrecy. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are as a people inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. 
And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. But I do ask, <laughs> but I do ask every publisher, every editor, and every newsman in the nation to re-examine his own standards and to recognize the nature of our country's peril. In time of war, the government and the press have customarily joined in an effort based largely on self-discipline to prevent unauthorized disclosures to the enemy. In times of clear and present danger, the courts have held that even the privileged rights of the First Amendment must yield to the public's need for national security. Today, no war has been declared. And however fierce the struggle may be, it may never be declared in the traditional fashion. Our way of life is under attack. Those who make themselves our enemy are advancing around the globe. The survival of our friends is in danger. And yet no war has been declared. No borders have been crossed by marching troops. No missiles have been fired. If the press is awaiting a declaration of war before it imposes the self-discipline of combat conditions, then I can only say that no war ever posed a greater threat to our security. If you are awaiting a finding of clear and present danger, then I can only say that the danger has never been more clear and its presence has never been more imminent. It requires a change in outlook, a change in tactics, a change in missions by the government, by the people, by every businessman or labor leader, and by every newspaper. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. It conducts the Cold War in short with a wartime discipline no democracy would ever hope or wish to match.